Ukraine versus Ru Russian Federation. In view of the current COVID-19 pandemic, the court has opted for a hybrid format for today's sitting. Vice President Gavordian, Judges Tomka, Abraham, Yusuf, Shwe, Sebutende, Iwasawa, Nolte, and Charlesworth, and Judge Adhak Dode are present with me in the Great Hall of Justice. Judges Benuna, Bandari, Robinson, and Salam are participating by video link. I recall that on 26 February 2022, Ukraine filed in the registry of the court an application instituting proceedings against the Russian Federation concerning, I quote, a dispute relating to the interpretation, application, and fulfillment of the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, end of quote, which I shall refer to as the Genocide Convention or the Convention. Together with the application, Ukraine submitted a request for the indication of provisional measures with reference to Article 41 of the statute and to Articles 73, 74, and 75 of the Rules of Court. I further recall that by a letter dated 5 March 2022, the ambassador of the Russian Federation to the Kingdom of the Netherlands indicated that his government had decided not to participate in the oral proceedings on the request for the indication of provisional measures. However, under cover of a letter dated 7 March 2022, he communicated to the court a document setting out, I quote, the position of the Russian Federation regarding the lack of jurisdiction of the court in the case, end of quotation. In accordance with our usual practice, I shall not read out the introductory paragraphs of the order, which set out the procedural history of the case. I shall also omit or summarize some other paragraphs. I shall accordingly begin the reading of the order at paragraph 17. The context in which the present case comes before the court is well known. On 24 February 2022, the President of the Russian Federation, Mr. Vladimir Putin, declared that he had decided to conduct an, I quote, special military operation, end of quote, against Ukraine. Since then, there has been intense fighting on Ukraine, Ukrainian territory, which has claimed many lives, has caused extensive displacement, and has resulted in widespread damage. The court is acutely aware of the extent of the human tragedy that is taking place in Ukraine and is deeply concerned about the continuing loss of life and human suffering. The court is profoundly concerned about the use of force by the Russian Federation in Ukraine, which raises very serious issues of international law. The court is mindful of the purposes and principles of the United Nations Charter and of its own responsibilities in the maintenance of international peace and security, as well as the peaceful settlement of disputes under the Charter and the Statute of the Court. It deems it necessary to emphasize that all states must act in conformity with their obligations under the United Nations Charter and other rules of international law, including international humanitarian law. The ongoing conflict between the parties has been addressed in the framework of several international institutions. The General Assembly of the United Nations adopted a resolution referring to many aspects of the conflict on 2 March 2022. The present case before the court, however, is limited in scope, as Ukraine has instituted these proceedings only under the Genocide Convention. The court wishes to express its regret at the decision taken by the Russian Federation not to participate in the oral proceedings on the request for indication of pro provisional measures. The non-appearance of a party has a negative impact on the sound administration of justice as it deprives the court of assistance that a party could have provided to it. Nevertheless, the court must proceed in the discharge of its judicial function at any phase of the case. Though formally absent from the proceedings, non-appearing parties sometimes submit to the court letters and documents in ways and by means not contemplated by its rules. It is valuable for the court to know the views of both parties in whatever form those views may have been expressed. The court will therefore take account of the document communicated by the Russian Federation on 7 March 2022 to the extent that it finds this appropriate in discharging its duties. 
The Court recalls that the non-appearance of one of the states concerned cannot in itself constitute an obstacle to the indication of provisional measures. It emphasizes that the non-participation of a party in the proceedings at any stage of the case cannot in any circumstances affect the validity of its decision. Should the present case extend beyond the current phase, the Russian Federation, which remains a party to the case, will be able, if it so wishes, to appear before the court to present its arguments. The court may indicate provisional measures only if the provisions relied on by the applicant appear prima facie to afford a basis on which its jurisdiction could be founded. But it need not satisfy itself in a definitive manner that it has jurisdiction as regards the merits of the case. In the present case, Ukraine seeks to found the jurisdiction of the court on Article 36, Paragraph 1 of the Statute of the Court, and on Article 9 of the Genocide Convention. The court must therefore first determine whether those provisions prima facie confer upon it jurisdiction to rule on the merits of the case, enabling it, if the other necessary conditions are fulfilled, to indicate provisional measures. Article 9 of the Genocide Convention reads as follows, I quote, disputes between the contracting parties relating to the interpretation, application, or fulfillment of the present convention, including those relating to the responsibility of a state for genocide or for any of the other acts enumerated in Article 3, shall be submitted to the International Court of Justice at the request of any of the parties to the dispute. Ukraine and the Russian Federation are both parties to the Genocide Convention. Neither of them maintains a reservation to Article 9. Article 9 of the Genocide Convention makes the court's jurisdiction conditional on the existence of a dispute relating to the interpretation, application, or fulfillment of the convention. According to the established case law of the court, a dispute is a disagreement on a point of law or fact, a conflict of legal views or interests between parties. In order for a dispute to, persist, to exist, it must be shown that the claim of one party is positively opposed by the other. The two sides must hold clearly opposite views concerning the question of the performance or non-performance of certain international obligations. To determine whether a dispute exists in a present case, the court cannot limit itself to noting that one of the parties maintains that the convention applies while the other denies it. Since Ukraine has invoked as the basis of the court's jurisdiction the compromissory clause in an international convention, the court must ascertain at the present stage of the proceedings whether it appears that the acts complained of by the applicant are capable of falling within the scope of that convention, ration materiae. Ukraine contends that a dispute exists between it and the Russian Federation relating to the interpretation, application, or fulfillment of the Genocide Convention. It maintains that the parties disagree on whether genocide, as defined in Article II of the Convention, has occurred or is occur occurring in the Luhansk and Donetsk oblasts of Ukraine, and whether Ukraine has committed genocide. It further argues that the dispute concerns the question whether, as a consequence of the Russian Federation's unilateral assertion that genocide is occurring, the Russian Federation has a lawful basis to take military action in and against Ukraine to prevent and punish genocide pursuant to Article I of the Genocide Convention. The Russian Federation, for, it, for its part, states that, in reality, its, I quote, special military operation, end of quote, on the territory of Ukraine is based on Article 51 of the United Nations Charter, and that the Convention cannot provide a legal basis for a military operation which is beyond the scope of the Convention. The Russian Federation therefore concludes that Ukraine's application and request manifestly fall beyond the scope of the Convention and thus the jurisdiction of the Court. It asks the Court to remove the case from its list. The Court recalls that for the purpose of deciding whether there was a dispute between the parties at the time of the filing of the application, it takes into account in particular any statements or documents exchanged between the parties, as well as any exchanges made in multilateral settings. In so doing, it pays special attention to the author of the statement or document, their intended or actual addressee, 
and their content. The existence of a dispute is a matter for objective determination by the court. It's a matter of substance and not a question of form or procedure. The court observes that since 2014, various state organs and senior representatives of the Russian Federation have referred in official statements to the commission of acts of genocide by Ukraine in the Luhansk and Donetsk regions. The court observes in particular that the investigative committee of the Russian Federation, an official state organ, has since 2014 instituted criminal proceedings against high-ranking Ukrainian officials regarding the alleged commission of acts of genocide against the Russian-speaking population living in the above-mentioned regions. I quote, in violation of the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, end of quote. The court recalls that in an address made on 21 February 2022, the president of the Russian Federation, Mr. Vladimir Putin, described the situation in Donbass as, I quote, horror and genocide, which almost four million people are facing, end of quotation. By a letter dated 24 February 2022, the permanent representative of the Russian Federation to the United Nations requested the Secretary General to circulate as a document of the Security Council the, I quote, text of the address of President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, to the citizens of Russia, informing them of the measures taken in accordance with Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations in exercise of the right of self-defense, end of quotation. In his address, pronounced on 24 February 2022, the President of the Russian Federation explained that he had decided, I quote, in accordance with Article 51, Chapter 7 of the Charter of the United Nations, to conduct a special military operation with the approval of the Federation Council of Russia and pursuant to treaties of friendship and mutual assistance with the Donetsk People's Republic and the Lugansk People's Republic. End of quotation. He specified that the purpose of the special operation was, I quote, to protect people who have been subjected to abuse and genocide by the Kiev regime for eight years. End of quotation. He stated that the Russian Federation had to stop a genocide against millions of people and that it would seek the prosecution of those who had committed numerous bloody crimes against civilians, including citizens of the Russian Federation. The permanent representative of the Russian Federation to the United Nations, referring to the address by, by the President of the Russian Federation on 24 February 2022, explained at a meeting of the Security Council on Ukraine that, I quote, the purpose of the special operation was to protect people who had been subjected to abuse and genocide by the Kiev regime for eight years, end of quotation. Two days later, the permanent representative of the Russian Federation to the European Union stated in an interview that the operation was a peace enforcement special military operation carried out in an effort aimed at denazification adding that people had actually been exterminated and that, I quote, the official term of genocide as coined in international law, if one reads the definition, fits pretty well, end of quotation. In response to the Russian Federation's allegations and its military actions, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine issued a statement on 26 February 2022, stating that Ukraine, I quote, strongly denies Russia's allegations of genocide and disputes any attempt to, such, to use such manipulative allegations as an excuse for Russia's unlawful aggression." End of quotation. At the present stage of these proceedings, the court is not required to ascertain whether any violations of obligations under the Genocide Convention have occurred in the context of the present dispute. Such a finding could be made by the court only at the stage of the examination of the merits of the present case. At this stage, the court's task is to establish whether the acts complained of by Ukraine appear to be capable of falling within the provisions of the Genocide Convention. The court recalls that while it is not necessary for a state 
to refer expressly to a specific treaty in its exchanges with the other state to enable it later to invoke the compromissory clause of that instrument to institute proceedings before the court, the exchanges must refer to the subject matter of the treaty with sufficient clarity to enable the state against which a claim is made to ascertain that there is or may be a dispute with regard to that subject matter. The court considers that in the present proceedings, the evidence in the case file demonstrates prima facie that statements made by the parties referred to the subject matter of the Genocide Convention in a sufficiently clear way to allow Ukraine to invoke the compromissory clause in this instrument as a basis for the court's jurisdiction. The statements made by the state organs and senior officials of the parties indicate a divergence of views as to whether certain acts allegedly committed by Ukraine in the Luhansk and Donetsk regions amount to genocide in violation of its obligations under the Genocide Convention, as well as whether the use of force by the Russian Federation for the stated purpose of preventing and punishing alleged genocide is a measure that can be taken in fulfillment of the obligation to prevent and punish genocide contained in Article I of the Convention. In the Court's view, the acts complained of by the applicant appear to be capable of falling within the provisions of the Genocide Convention. The Court recalls the Russian Federation's assertion that its, quote, special military operation, end of quote, is based on Article 51 of the United Nations Charter and customary international law. The Court observes in this respect that certain acts or omissions may give rise to a dispute that falls within the ambit of more than one treaty. This assertion of the Russian Federation does not therefore preclude a prima facie finding by the Court that the dispute presented by the application relates to the interpretation, application, or fulfillment of the Genocide Convention. The Court finds therefore that the above mentioned elements are sufficient at this stage to establish prima facie the existence of a dispute between the parties relating to the interpretation, application, or fulfillment of the Genocide Convention. In light of the foregoing, the Court concludes that prima facie, it has jurisdiction pursuant to Article 9 of the Genocide Convention to entertain the case. Given the above conclusion, the Court considers that it cannot accede to the Russian Federation's request that the case be removed from the general list for manifest lack of jurisdiction. The power of the Court to indicate provisional measures under Article 41 of the statute has as its object the preservation of the respective rights claimed by the parties in a case, pending its decision on the merits. It follows that the Court must be concerned to preserve by such measures the rights which may subsequently be adjudged by it to belong to either party. Therefore, the Court may exercise this power only if it is satisfied that the rights asserted by the party requesting such measures are at least plausible. At this stage of the proceedings, however, the Court is not called upon to determine definitively whether the rights which Ukraine seeks to protect exist. It need only determine whether the rights claimed by Ukraine on the merits and for which it is seeking protection are plausible. Moreover, a link must exist between the rights whose protection is sought and the provisional measures being requested. In the present proceedings, Ukraine argues that it seeks provisional measures to protect its rights, I quote, not to be subject to a false claim of genocide and not to be subjected to another state's military operations on its territory based on a brazen abuse of Article I of the Genocide Convention, end of quotation. Ukraine contends that it has a right to demand good faith performance of obligations under the Genocide Convention by the Russian Federation in accordance with the object and purpose of the Convention. It states that the Russian Federation has abused and misused the rights and duties stipulated in the Convention and that the, quote, special military operation, close quote, of the respondent is an aggression undertaken under the guise of the duty to prevent and punish genocide enshrined in Articles 1 and 4 of the Convention and that it frustrates the object and purpose of the Convention. The Court observes that in accordance with Article 1 of the Convention, all parties thereto have undertaken to prevent and to punish the crime of genocide. 
Article 1 does not specify the kinds of measures that a contracting party may take to fulfill this obligation. However, the contracting parties must implement this obligation in good faith, taking into account other parts of the Convention, in particular Articles 8 and 9, as well as its preamble. Pursuant to Article 8 of the Convention, a contracting party that considers that genocide is taking place in the territory of another contracting party may call upon the competent organs of the United Nations to take such action under the Charter of the United Nations as they consider appropriate for the prevention and suppression of acts of genocide or of any of the other acts enumerated in Article 3. In addition, pursuant to Article 9, such a contracting party may submit to the court a dispute relating to the interpretation, application, or fulfillment of the Convention. A contracting party may resort to other means of fulfilling its obligation to prevent and punish genocide that it believes to have been committed by another contracting party, such as bilateral engagements or exchanges within a regional organization. However, the court emphasizes that in discharging its duty to prevent genocide, every state may only act within the limits permitted by international law, as was stated in a previous case brought under the Convention. The acts undertaken by the contracting parties to prevent and punish genocide must be in conformity with the spirit and aims of the United Nations, as set out in Article I of the United Nations Charter. The court can only take a decision on an applicant's claims if the case proceeds to the merits. At the present stage of the proceedings, it suffices to observe that the court is not in the possession of evidence substantiating the allegation of the Russian Federation that genocide has been committed on Ukrainian territory. Moreover, it is doubtful that the Convention, in light of its object and purpose, authorizes a contracting party's unilateral use of force in the territory of another state for the purpose of preventing or punishing an alleged genocide. Under these circumstances, the Court considers that Ukraine has a plausible right not to be subjected to military operations by the Russian Federation for the purpose of preventing and punishing an alleged genocide in the territory of Ukraine. The Court now turns to the condition of the link between the rights claimed by Ukraine and the provisional measures requested. The Court has already found that Ukraine is asserting a right that is plausible under the Genocide Convention. The Court considers that by their very nature, the first two provisional measures sought by Ukraine are aimed at preserving the rights of Ukraine that the Court has found to be plausible. As to the third and fourth provisional measures requested by Ukraine, the question of their link with that plausible right does not arise, insofar as such measures would be directed at preventing any action which may aggravate or extend the existing dispute or render it more difficult to resolve and at providing information on the compliance with any specific provisional measure indicated by the Court. The Court concludes, therefore, that a link exists between the right of Ukraine that the Court has found to be plausible and the requested provisional measures. The Court, pursuant to Article 41 of its statute, has the power to indicate provisional measures when irreparable prejudice could be caused to rights which are the subject of judicial proceedings or when the alleged disregard of such rights may entail irreparable consequences. However, the power of the Court to indicate provisional measures will be exercised only if there is urgency in the sense that there is a real and imminent risk that irreparable prejudice will be caused to the rights claimed before the Court gives its final decision. The condition of urgency is met when the acts susceptible of causing irreparable prejudice can occur at any moment before the Court makes a final decision in the case. The Court must therefore consider whether such a risk exists at this stage of the proceedings. The Court is not called upon for the purpose of its decision on the request for indication of provisional measures to establish the existence of breaches of obligations under the Genocide Convention, but to determine whether the circumstances require the indication of provisional measures for the protection of the right found to be plausible. It cannot at this stage make definitive findings of fact, and the right of each party to submit arguments in respect of the merits remains unaffected by the Court's decision on the request for the indication of provisional measures. 
Having previously determined that Ukraine can plausibly assert a right under the Genocide Convention and that there is a link between this right and the provisional measures requested, the Court now considers whether irreparable prejudice could be caused to this right and whether there is urgency in the sense that there is a real and imminent risk that irreparable prejudice will be caused to this right before the Court gives its final decision. The Court considers that the right of Ukraine that it has found to be plausible is of such a nature that prejudice to it is capable of causing irreparable harm. Indeed, any military operation, in particular one on the scale carried out by the Russian Federation on the territory of Ukraine, inevitably causes loss of life, mental and bodily harm, and damage to property and the environment. The Court considers that the civilian population affected by the present conflict is extremely vulnerable. The, quote, special military operation, end of quote, being conducted by the Russian Federation has resulted in numerous civilian deaths and injuries. It has also caused significant material damage, including the destruction of buildings and infrastructure. Attacks are ongoing and are creating increasingly difficult living conditions for the civilian population. Many persons have no access to the most basic foodstuffs potable water, electricity, essential medicines, or heating. A very large number of people are attempting to flee from the most affected cities under extremely insecure conditions. In this regard, the Court takes note of the 2 March 2022 resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations, which inter alia, I quote, expresses grave concern at the reports of attacks on civilian facilities such as residences, schools, and hospitals, and of civilian casualties, including women, older persons, persons with disabilities, and children, recognizes the, that the military operations of the Russian Federation inside the sovereign territory of Ukraine are on a scale that the international community has not seen in Europe in decades, and that urgent action is needed to save this generation from the scourge of war condemns the decision of the Russian Federation to increase the readiness of its forces and expresses grave concern at the deteriorating humanitarian situation in and around Ukraine with an increasing number of internally displaced persons and refugees in need of humanitarian assistance. End of quotation. In light of these circumstances, the Court concludes that the disregard of the right deemed plausible by the Court could cause irreparable prejudice to this right and that there is urgency in the sense that there is a real and imminent risk that such prejudice will be caused before the court makes a final decision in this case. The court concludes on the basis of all of the above considerations that the conditions required by its statute for it to indicate provisional measures are met. It is therefore necessary, pending its final decision, for the court to indicate certain measures in order to protect the right of Ukraine that the court has found to be plausible. The court recalls that it has the power under its statute, when a request for provisional measures has been made, to indicate measures that are in whole or in part other than those requested. Article 75, paragraph 2 of the Rules of Court specifically refers to this power of the court. The court has already exercised this power on several occasions in the past. In the present case, having considered the terms of the provisional measures requested by Ukraine and the circumstances of the case, the Court finds that the measures to be indicated need not be identical to those requested. The Court considers that, with regard to the situation described above, the Russian Federation must, pending the final decision in the case, suspend the military operations that it commenced on 24 February 2022 in the territory of Ukraine. In addition, recalling the statement of the permanent representative of the Russian Federation to the United Nations that the, I quote, Donetsk People's Republic and the Lugansk People's Republic, end of quotation, had turned to the Russian Federation with a request to grant military support, the court considers that the Russian Federation must also ensure that any military or irregular armed units which may be directed or supported by it as well as any organizations and persons which may be subject to its control and direction, take no steps in furtherance of those military operations. The Court recalls that Ukraine 
also requested it to indicate measures aimed at ensuring the non-aggravation of the dispute with the Russian Federation. When it indicates provisional measures for the purpose of preserving specific rights, the court may also indicate provisional measures with a view to preventing the aggravation or extension of the dispute if it considers that those circumstances so require. In the present case, having considered all the circumstances, in addition to the specific measures it has decided to order, the court deems it necessary to indicate an additional measure directed at both parties and aimed at ensuring the non-aggravation of the dispute. The court further recalls that Ukraine requested it to indicate a provisional measure directing the Russian Federation to provide a report to the court on measures taken to implement the court's order on provisional measures one week after such order, and then on a regular basis to be fixed by the court. In the circumstances of the present case, however, the court declines to indicate such a measure. The court reaffirms that its orders on provisional measures under Article 41 of the statute have binding effect and thus create international legal obligations for any party to whom the provisional measures are addressed. The court further reaffirms that the decision given in the present proceedings in no way prejudices the question of the jurisdiction of the court to deal with the merits of the case or any questions relating to the admissibility of the application or to the merits themselves. It leaves unaffected the right of the governments of Ukraine and of the Russian Federation to submit arguments in respect of those questions. For these reasons, the court indicates the following provisional measures. By 13 votes to two, the Russian Federation shall immediately suspend the military operations that it commenced on 24 February 2022 in the territory of Ukraine. In favor, President Donahue, Judges Tomka, Abraham, Benuna, Yusuf, Sebutinde, Bandari, Robinson, Salam, Iwasawa, Nolte, Charlesworth, Judge Adhak Dode. Against, Vice President Kevorgian, Judge Shui. By 13 votes to two, the Russian Federation shall ensure that any military or irregular armed units which may be directed or supported by it, as well as any organizations and persons which may be subject to its control or direction, take no steps in furtherance of the military operations referred to in point one above. In favor, President Donahue, Judges Tomka, Abraham, Benuna, Yusuf, Sebutinde, Bandari, Robinson, Salam, Iwasawa, Nolte, Charlesworth, Judge Adhak Dode. Against, Vice President Kevorgian, Judge Shui. Three, unanimously, both parties shall refrain from any action which may aggravate or extend the dispute before the court or make it more difficult to resolve. I shall now call upon the registrar to read the operative part of the order in French. Par ces motifs, la Cour indique à titre provisoire les mesures conservatoires suivantes. 1. Par 13 voix contre 2. La Fédération de Russie doit suspendre.